London. So uh, today we're going to be talking about AI for sustainable development. I'm David, David Barber from University College London. And um, we've got a panel session, which is a, I hope going to be a very interesting discussion around these themes. In particular, we're interested in talking about does AI have the potential to help tackle global and societal challenges, for example, climate change, global food security, education, use and inequality. We're also going to explore why and how AI can be useful to make and measure progress towards the sustainable development goals. I'm delighted to say that we've got a very esteemed panel. Uh, we've got Professor Maria Fasley. Uh, she's the UNESCO Chair in Analytics and Data Science from the University of Essex. And we've got Julian Cornebis, uh, who's a non-remember member from UCL Computer Science Department, but has a very long and uh, interesting career in, in machine learning, in particular with a strong theme of AI for social good, having worked at DeepMind, Element AI, and Amnesty. And finally, but not least, we have Professor John Shaw Taylor from UCL, who's the UNESCO Chair in AI. So I'm going to switch over now to the panel. And if you can all see me, uh, perhaps we can start, Maria, with yourself. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what's involved with the UNESCO Chair? Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, session. So my name is Maria Fasli. I'm the UNESCO Chair in Analytics and Data Science at the University of Essex. By background, I'm a computer scientist. I have been working in artificial intelligence since my undergraduate, postgraduate and uh, programs. Um, and uh, since 2016, I have been designated as the UNESCO Chair in Analytics and Data Science. So this involves working uh, with uh, UNESCO or under the auspices of UNESCO, I should uh, more correctly say. Um, UNESCO focuses on education, social and cultural uh, aspects. So the emphasis of the chair and my activities are around supporting education activities of, um, uh, in the area of data science and analytics. And in particular, I have uh, three main uh, objectives in my role as UNESCO chair. The first one is to undertake novel research in this area, but underpinned by the principle of undertaking research for the benefit of global society and global good, rather than just undertaking research for the sake of uh, pushing uh, the knowledge boundaries, which is an eminent goal in, in itself. Um, this, my second objective is to develop novel education programs uh, that will enable training and upskilling of graduates, and not just graduates, but people of all ages, and including professionals. There's a, a massive lack of skills in artificial intelligence and data science, so um, one of my priorities is precisely this development of skills and uh, research capacity and expertise. But the, one of the, uh, the, the third and uh, perhaps the goal that relates directly to what we will be talking about later today is working together with international collaborators on joint research and education initiatives with the aim being to develop research capacity and the skills in developing and transitioning countries in particular uh, in the in, in the UK and in the Western world, let's uh, let's put it like that. We have uh, very well developed education systems, and we have novel programs in all sorts of areas. So, but there's um, there's a lack of skills, which is more acute in developing and transitioning countries. So, uh, my role is is key in supporting. Uh, uh, international collaborators in this respect, but that does not mean imposing what uh, I think is the is the right approach. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll come back to to chat. I think about some of those topics later. Uh, Julien, would you like to tell us a little bit about your fascinating journey through machine learning AI and what's what's going on with this sort of strong strand of AI for for good? 
Uh, well, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining from uh, the confines of your lockdown houses. Uh, really appreciate you all taking the time to hear us. Uh, and we'd love, you know, we're looking forward to hearing from you in, in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm a machine learner. I mean, I'm a mathematician and computer scientist by training. Um, did my PhD in France, bunch of postdocs uh, in the US, Canada, UK at UCL. And in 2012, joined a small startup called DeepMind at the time. I was a fifth researcher. I had the chance to see it grow from 30 people to 400, uh, going through the Google acquisition, moving there from pure algorithms and uh, theoretical work towards more applications by creating their health research team, precisely because I felt I love so, you know, proving theorems, developing algorithm. It's really fun, but it's like crosswords. Uh, on the application, the application side was uh, was sorely sorely missing. I wanted to see the impact, so moved to healthcare for that. And in uh, 2016, uh, realized that the healthcare system, and, and healthcare is I think SDG number uh, number three, health and, and well-being story, sustainable development goals, uh, number three. Important as it is, is uh, possibly not the field where I could have the most impact. Uh, I had built a fantastic team and the results are still coming out, working hand in hand with clinicians. Uh, but I felt that the, the, different incent the different problem at the heart of healthcare is not so much a technological problem as a, a, a problem of incentives and vehicles. Um, the, you know, either you have the UK where you have almost no money in healthcare and those who stay are the true believers, uh, or you have the US where there's almost too much money uh, in healthcare. So I decided to, to leave healthcare for a side and started volunteering with Amnesty. Uh, only as a volunteer, uh, sorry, I need to correct that I was not employed by them, but only, uh, only volunteering. And really there working with the view that, look, I have no clue about SDGs. I have no clue about human rights. Uh, I've got good clues about algorithm and theorems, uh, but they are the real experts about how to even have impact uh, with any action they're taking. And so it was really about how can we make sure that they can use the same tools that other players are using? And how can we use these tools to multiply their impact? So throughout the last four years, my focus has well be, always been about how do we put all these cool tools that we are developing, whether it be in, in deep learning, of course, or machine learning generally, or even every quantitative tools, how do we put them in the hands of the domain experts? whether they be clinicians, whether they be human rights researchers, whether they be um, UN agencies, how do we get them the tools? Now, as we've worked, uh, so I've, I've been privileged to work uh, with Amnesty on detecting um, destroyed villages in Darfur on satellite imagery, uh, working with Human Rights Watch, working with, uh, again with Amnesty this time on, on abuse against women on Twitter. And, Paradoxically, I mean, much as I started as a nerd, you know, coding in assembly in the late night at uh, age 14, the more we proceed and the more I am very cautious around the world, the work on AI for good. And I put heavy air quotes there because it can be used way too often as whitewashing. And look, oh, yeah, AI is helping do this with satellite. Yeah, it's also helping to monitor everyone with satellite. Or look, it's fantastic. We're distributing some cloud to help. Uh, you know, monitoring water in, in Africa. Yeah, but with the same cloud, you're powering uh, ICE, uh, immigration and custom agencies uh, to, to track people. And, and for that, I think we have a, a, um, a duty, you know, I've moved from, let's empower those who know how to have impact, which I think is still a fundamental component and where, of course, AI and algorithm can prove a, a lot of help to even going back to the, the a first step of, uh, you know, if I were to, to, to copy health professionals, do no harm. And if I look today, you know, we are on this panel, uh, we are four white persons, uh, three, uh, you know, four European, three of us men. Uh, and there has been a, a lot of work um, done in information and communication technologies for development over the last 30 years. And a lot of it has come often as uh, being very well intended and well-meaning, but a, a kind of new form of, uh, of colonialism. So a, a second part of you know, actually using AI for sustainable development uh, would be to 
make sure that it's not just white people behind their laptop in, in, uh, in, in London on satellite imagery, um, but actual people uh, are on the ground. And, and there, they know the domain, they know the problem directly there. And possibly it's not gonna be an AI solution that they need, mind you. It might be actually an institutional solution to uh, avoid, um, avoid corruption and actually build infrastructures. And maybe AI can help uh, the UN monitor that, but I wouldn't want AI to distract from the core problems or, you know, the worst case, there's two worst case for me. Getting a lot of money to do something fancy with AI because, oh, it's exciting, uh, but depriving actual simpler solutions, which would be more efficient and depriving from, from having an impact uh, or actual locally driven initiatives. Uh, and the second worst case would be developing something, say, with amnesty uh, to detect villages, and that would then be used by the Sudanese military to find the villages and bomb them. And I want to flag what makes me hopeful um, uh, recently is that all these qualms, you know, are, are very present in, in the community, maybe not as much as they should, but it's, it's getting there. And there is this uh, PhD student at University of Washington. He's the developer of the YOLO algorithms. For those of you who don't know it, it's an object detector algorithm. It's one of the most widely used algorithms. It's used to find objects in videos, in CCTVs, detect faces. It's widely, widely used. And this graduate student who has made this fantastic algorithm, he could make his entire academic career off the back of that, has announced in February that he was stopping research on computer vision because the downsides were massively overwhelming the upsides. And I find it really inspiring that younger researchers coming into the field are coming with this kind of ethics resolve, not you know, later on in their career when they are safe, but from the get-go. And that makes me, makes me really, really hopeful. So in summary, it's how do we avoid the hype, um, making AI do more harm uh, than good, and how do we focus on having the solutions come not as a form of uh, of technological colonialism. Great, great, thank you. So um, I should just say before introducing uh, John that actually uh, Maya Pantage, uh, who was the original uh, final panel member, unfortunately had a minute emergency. So John kindly uh, stepped in. Um, so John, would you like to tell us a little bit about your your role, as the UNESCO chair in in AI? Uh, sure, thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here, uh, even if only at the last minute. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to just mention really a little bit of background of uh, how I got involved in uh, the relationship with UNESCO, because it is, in some sense, a little bit, perhaps, an uh, analogous story to the one that Julian has, has described in his, uh, you know, I started out as a machine learner. Uh, more interested in the theory uh, and how that might be, uh, you know, used to 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 in, in, inform practice. Um, and I was coordinating uh, a series of networks of excellence within the European funding uh, scheme. Uh, and the last of those were Pascal and Pascal II, which I, I think developed a little bit of a reputation of also meddling in other people's business and suggesting, you know, to computer vision people, uh, you know, machine learning might be useful and, and, and natural language processing and so on. Uh, so I think we, we sort of were seen as pioneering in that way of pushing the machine learning and AI agenda uh, more widely. And at the end of that, uh, that network, uh, there was a request by the European Commission that we create some permanent legacy. And as a result of that, we established um, a UK charity known as the Knowledge for All Foundation, which I'm the principal trustee of. And uh, that, through that, we actually, one of the things that we were pioneering within Pascal was the video uh, recording of educational material, lectures, workshops, summer schools, etc. Uh, and this was put through a portal actually hosted in Slovenia, the Josef Stefan Institute, uh, known as videolectures.net, um, and it would received a UNESCO World uh, Summit Award. Uh, and 
that started a relationship between Knowledge for All and the Josef Stefan Institute and uh, UNESCO. And one of the things that we got involved in was the promotion of a recommendation around the use of open educational resources, which uh, a recommendation is actually quite a, a difficult thing for UNESCO to um, uh, create because it requires every member state who's a part of UNESCO, which is most member states, uh, most uh, states in the world, uh, agreeing to the text. So it's a quite long, lengthy process, and we were heavily involved in that um, with the help, I must say, of the Slovene government. And that was finally adopted in November of last year. Uh, so there is now a recommendation which is mandating governments around the world to you know, use and promote the use of uh, open educational resources. Um, but then also through that, we got involved in the idea of uh, artificial intelligence and how it might be used for sustainable development goals. And for example, we are funded through Knowledge for All to help uh, instigate a network of practitioners and experts in artificial intelligence in sub-Saharan Africa, which is you know, a very exciting experience. And there's enormous amount going on there. And the small bit we can contribute is, is small by comparison with what is already happening, but I hope we are contributing at least both to increasing awareness, but also uh, increasing the links that they can build with the, uh, the activity. And this where I would also link with what Julian said, you know, for me, the, the, the solution is about empowering people on the ground with the problems that are there. Uh, with the skill sets that will enable them to tackle them in the most effective way. And if that's AI, great. If it isn't, then that's also great. But let's get the solutions and let's try to, you know, empower people to come up with those solutions. So I think that's, uh, you know, one of the leading kind of thoughts or directions that the Knowledge for All Foundation has been adopting. Uh, and the other thing that's come out of this is the establishment of a so-called UNESCO Center for uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, in, uh, at the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia, in which I'm also involved, and I think is also an exciting development because it is directly addressing this issue uh, that the panel is considering, AI for Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and I think, again, you know, this is an area where highlighted in the introduction were two things. One is AI helping to provide solutions or suggest solutions, but also AI for measuring progress, which I think is very vital. And maybe I'll just say a little about that and the way in which I think it could be a game changer. Um, and certainly the uh, center, which is known as IRKAI in, in Slovenia, is, is hoping to leverage this idea that if we can get better measurement, um, there is actually enormous goodwill and real money interested in investing in uh, solutions that will actually make an impact on the sustainable development goals. Uh, the problem is partly um, channeling that money, but it's also convincing those investors that we have ways of assessing the impact. In a sense, you can think of the stock market as a very, very efficient way of assessing the efficiency of companies and redirecting resources towards those that are more efficient. But we don't have the equivalent for uh, impact. How could we have a system that would allow uh, objective and you know, very fast measurement of the impact of different companies in sustainable development goals? taking into account all of the issues that Julian has mentioned, which I think are very pertinent to this question. If we were able to do that, in a, it would, I think, create an enormous opportunity for people to invest and to actually make much more significant impact uh, through the goodwill that everybody has, I believe, in this area. But if we don't have that, you know, how quickly it can turn into a disillusionment of oh, the money I put into a charity, you know, how much of that gets used by the uh, administrators or whatever, you know, all of these kind of 
questions that are not answered clearly enough. So uh, perhaps I'll just end with that as a as a thought to put on the table. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. So I just wanted though to you know because this session is about AI for uh, sustainable development goals. So it'd be good if we can uh, try to understand actually you know where AI itself could be could be useful if possible. So. Um, I just wanted to, you know, briefly ask um, you know, each of you, you know, what what do you think is the potential realistically for for AI in in terms of sustainable development? Is there other particular areas where this is more likely to be to be useful, or you know, is is it all hype, or is actually is there something of you know substance? So Maria, perhaps I can I can start with you. Yes, thank you. Um... So um, let me start by saying that I personally believe that AI has huge potential to support uh, sustainable, de uh, sustainable development and to support in particular the delivery and measurement of, sustainable, uh, of the sustainable development goals. But I think we need to nuance that quite a bit. For the start, I think we need to be clear what we mean by sustainable development. Um, and what we mean by AI, um, because there are all sorts of misunderstanding, misunderstandings around both these terms, and it depends on how you really interpret them both. So you could say, for instance, a sustainable development as per the UN definition is just meeting the needs uh, in the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Or you could um, take this a step further and say sustainable development is mainly targeted to developing countries because these are the ones that are the poor ones. These are the ones that uh, lack uh, uh, the economic development. So it really depends on how, how, you, um, uh, how you interpret, how you understand sustainable development and how you understand, as I said, and how you interpret uh, AI. And one of my big frustrations is that a lot of people uh, essentially equate ML with machine learning with AI. And there's a lot of hype uh, around AI. There's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, communities, groups, individuals can appropriate the terminology for their own purposes and there are all these risks that both Julian and, uh, and John talked about but for me I, I see AI as, um, as uh, both my previous um, speakers, panelists, members talked about as a, as a way to empower people but to empower people not uh, just in the developing and transitioning countries also in our developed countries, what we would consider developed countries, because we very often associate sustainable development with the developing countries. But I think the recent events uh, and incidents and the movement uh, Black Lives Matter just highlight how much inequality we actually have in our Western world and how much we tend to ignore the needs of the of the local populations. We focus because we think we understand what other countries that are in a worse position than than we are need and, and we try and help them. And I, I take completely the point of colonialism that Julian brought um, up earlier. Um, and we need we need obviously to stop doing that, but we need to address this colonialism even within uh, our existing, you know, within our own countries. So um, just to summarize, I, th I do believe there's there's great potential for all sorts of ways to, to, um, to uh, support sustainable development across the world. How we do it, it's entirely up to us. And there are really big challenges and there are really big risks. And if we don't tread carefully, we are risking another, if you like, AI winter coming our, our way. And uh, this would have really, really significant consequences on the research community as well as the global community. Great, thanks. So, uh, Julian, a, a similar question for you, but maybe we can try to, um, if, we could, if it could be a little bit more specific, you know, other actual the specific things that I think you know the AI community can do. I mean, bearing in mind the 
the broader sort of um, you know sort of questions around you know, the stability of uh, this and colonialism, etc. But what what practical things are are likely to be achievable? Uh, there there is um, there are many aspects obviously that can be delivered with uh, AI. And I agree with Maria. You know, let's not use the term AI as just machine learning. It's marginally quantitative methods. Obviously, computer vision is uh, is as brilliantly advanced with the advent of deep learning, and there is a lot that can be done there for water monitoring, for especially combined with satellite. Yes, yeah, there is a lot that can be done there, whether it be detecting, uh, bringing proofs of uh, massacres, if we look at the human rights lands, or looking at uh, the, the um, water management and the different water sources or land occupation, or uh, if we look at more uh, an SDG um, angle. Uh, John's point uh, about measurement, um, I, there is a lot there precisely that can be undone too, because yeah, what's good to have a satellite if you're not on the ground? Well, precisely you can use that as a measurement tool, either to convince philanthropists to provide their money, uh, or different agencies, or uh, to enforce some restrictions around, well, you should not pollute uh, too much by doing, uh, you know, factory, you commit to not polluting. Well, actually, if you can actually verify that at a large scale. There is other, if we, if we move away from deep learning and look at AI or machine learning or uh, data science uh, or algorithmic approaches, there is a, a fantastic word, I've got to, to call it out here, done by Felix Lohmann at uh, Imperial College in the math department. And he's using uh, data science and uh, causal, causal theory to analyze the interdependency amongst sustainable development goals. Uh, so I know someone, I think uh, Stephen Browning here asked a question about uh, what, what happens if you solve one area but make another one worse. This kind of, um, of, of approach can help but uh, precisely the, oh, you should fix A because by fixing A, you do good on B, C, and D, and vice versa, you're not damaging E, e and F. I mean, now a panel, if we all agree, is boring. Uh, so I'm just going to throw, throw a spanner about measurement, uh, and I, I recommend um, uh, Michael Feinberg's um, articles in The Guardian a few years ago, uh, saying that if you try to measure everything, uh, you have a risk of going into analysis paralysis. And that echoes uh, Roger Bregman's book, Utopia for Realists, where he says, well, instead of trying to justify uh, and making people jump through hoop to show the good that they could be doing and the good that this organization is doing, why don't you give the money directly to the people on the ground? So precisely on, on, a, on a, a, an AI approach there, there is a fantastic um, a company or a startup in Somalia created by some people who was trying to uh, listen to get a make a feedback mechanism for people on the ground saying hey we have a drought here or hey the, the highway that said you built here is still not built now organizations like that gonna be a lot of burden for for them to provide to prove and jump through the hoops of uh, of measurement and reporting uh, if we were to open much more wide the wider the, the flow of money going to such initiatives, um, you would actually spend energy on solving problems rather than reporting on them. And sometimes you might have actual results that you were not expecting. When with Amnesty International, we made this report combining their qualitative approach and our quantitative approach on abuse on Twitter, uh, Twitter stock plummeted 13% overnight. Now, they recovered a week later, but still, that was uh, an impact of, uh, I think I counted $2.5 billion impact overnight, uh, which you know then led to uh, the CEO of Twitter to meet the, the CEO of Amnesty and, and them to be a little bit more careful, far from having solved the problem, but a little bit more careful. Now, this is not at all what we had expected when we started this uh, this project, and we would not have been able to put in any funding proposal well, with this project, we expect that we will be able to take 13% of Twitter's market cap. So th there is a, th that's why I'm, I'm being a little cautious about the, the measurement. And yes, AI through computer vision, through analysis of data can bring much better measurement, but let's make sure that we are not solving uh, a problem that actually where the root problem uh, is actually in the way we structure aid in general.
Great, great. Thank, thank you, Julian. So actually, John, I wanted to put a similar question to yourself as well, but we've had also uh, a question uh, coming through from the audience. But well, you know, we've talked a, quite a lot about sustainability in terms of developing countries, uh, and certainly, uh, well, uh, particularly in the southern hemisphere at least. But you know, there are other elements to sustainable development goals, perhaps outside of that. So uh, Julian mentioned uh, some issues to do with Twitter, but is it other other things that can other other areas outside of say uh, the southern hemisphere where uh, machine learning and AI could actually be also useful? Um, I was actually going to, I mean, before you asked that question, but I think what I was going to say is sort of relevant to that question too. I was going to sort of <clears throat> highlight that I think one of the SDGs where AI could have um, a very significant impact and, and, you know, through it actually impact other SDGs is, is the uh, question of education. Um, in a sense, you know, it's coming back to the point you made before, if we can empower people, to solve the problems, uh, and I don't mean just education in AI. I mean generally education. Um, clearly, there you know is a, a real demand now globally for high quality education, but the you know uh, the demand is not met by the supply, and I think AI provides the tools that could you know meet the gap in uh, in a relatively effective way. I mean, I'm not saying it's the same. Uh, as uh, in-person education, but now with the level of understanding that we can uh, gather from interactions with users remotely and the other ideas of social interaction, you know, uh, moderated through computer uh, links, I think there is the opportunity to create an educational environment that is both exciting and uh, enriching through the use of AI in uh, online education. And in fact, you know, we, I'm involved in a project, coordinating a project uh, currently that is, is trying to do just that, uh, a European, again, collaboration. Um, but I mean, I'm, I think there are many other efforts uh, uh, going on worldwide, so I wouldn't want to say, you know, that's a solution, but I, I wanted to just emphasize, I think that is one of the, if you like, uh, early, adopters that we should think about in terms of AI addressing uh, a sustainable development goal. And to pick up your point about, well, you know, what, what, what about the developed world? Yes, I mean, we do have inequalities in educational provision here and in many countries. And I think this is, again, uh, can be addressed through the type of provision that I'm suggesting is, is an important development. Uh, so I absolutely agree that we shouldn't just think of and, and it's coming back to that colonial idea that, oh, everybody else needs help, we don't. No, this is about helping everybody uh, who needs uh, in every every part of the world. Um, so, uh, but I think, again, you know, the, 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 the key to addressing that colonial issue is empowerment. If you can empower people wherever they are to solve their problems and to tackle them in creative ways, that is actually undermining you know the, the, the need for colonialism or, or the, the, you know, the ability of colonialism to survive in whatever form. Uh, so empowerment is the key and education I believe is the, the key to empowerment. And if I may flag here, sorry to, to, to bounce on that, the fantastic initiative called the Deep Learning in Daba, uh, which is mm. a series in Daba X, which is a series of uh, workshops uh, and summer cool, schools and conferences throughout Africa. Uh, started by Shakir Mohamed, uh, who is uh, currently at DeepMind, uh, who is a fantastic researcher you know, on the technical side uh, and is also deeply committed to very much these problematics. And he set this up a few years ago. Uh, it has been really, really booming, and it's at the heart of the, the kind of empowerment that, uh, that, that John is mentioning. Yeah, we're, we're working with them in that uh, AI for development that I mentioned, but... Uh, we're being funded by the Canadian Development Fund to, you know, uh, bring together uh, also Data Science Africa. There's quite a few act activities in Sub-Saharan Africa, but Indaba X is certainly the, the leader in that field and is fantastic one, really. Yeah. And if I can add to the, to the two points that my uh, fellow panelists have made, 
this idea of empowerment you can only facilitate through education because if we educate at all levels and when I would not just think about education in AI and in general understanding of data just meaning university level education I would actually look at education in a more holistic way looking at even primary school children and making sure that they understand data because we're talking about essentially equipping the citizens of the future to be able to understand data because that's the way that you can be a participant in, 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 in public life and you have the ability to, um, to question governments, to hold governments, organizations, institutions into account. And this empowerment is really fundamental. And um, in my role as UNESCO chair, as I, as, as I was saying at the start, this is why um, I've decided uh, to, uh, to, to delve into this area because I think this is a, a fundamental notion. And unless we actually bring the skills into, into countries locally, no matter what solutions we offer, um, they will not be adopted. We need we need to ed we need to support education so that people can then take it upon themselves to create local solutions, to create the solutions that would work for them rather than us, assuming that we know the solutions and we just pass them on. But so, so Maria, I mean, is there what is the mechanism behind that? I mean, is there you know how how do you get those sort of you know local stakeholders actually on board i mean so what you're talking about is uh you know something very basic in you know in terms of the you know getting the infrastructure if you like the conceptual platform ready um but how do you how do you actually go about that how do you make sure that people are actually the stakeholders are on board with this idea um well the very short answer is sometimes with great difficulty because you need to have a vision if you are a leader, if you are in government, you need to have a vision in order to be able to see that education within country and for AI in particular is not just about necessarily, uh, as, I, as I was saying, university level education. But it, we have a role and quite a unique role to play here as researchers and as scientists in engaging with our um, both in country politicians, but governments across the world, and UNESCO and the UN can actually be the facilitator in this, uh, so that we can bring them around to understand a the potential of AI, uh, but also uh, the potential risks, and then how they can uh, work with us and uh, develop this conceptual framework and this education framework that we need in place. So we need to constantly engage. And we, as I said, I, I do believe we have a key role here. And um, as, as scientists, we understand the potential and we need to be able to explain it, though, in a, in a way that politicians will understand, uh, because it's very often said that you will only have the attention of a politician for a few seconds. So we need to come up with the right messages of how it is that AI, uh, data science, technology, can can help them deliver what they want for their for their citizens. That's great. So I mean that sounds all very very good, and but you know, to sounds like a little bit vague. Still, in some sense, I don't mean to uh, negative. But what concrete things can can we actually do? So it's great. I understand the the ideas, but what are we specifically? What are the action items? on us as a community of AI researchers to actually do, to help deliver on these points. Julian, is there other specific things that, that you would recommend that we as a community start to do? I mean, there's a, there, there's a few. Uh, first, if you're looking for, uh, as, as you asked earlier, concrete cases of AI helping, for example, on, on education, UNICEF uh, and the, precisely their, their innovation lab um, have worked on mapping all the schools in the world. Uh, so that the, then UNICEF can go directly and engage uh, and provide resources to the schools uh, on the ground there. So that's if we're looking for, you know, one I would almost say token uh, application of, uh, of of AI to to education concretely on the ground. Now, if we're talking about a community, um, there is a fantastic. I keep using the word fantastic because precisely the people we're lucky to work in a field where the people uh, involved 
are, are extremely high quality. So there is this, this initiative called Black in AI, for example, um, which is uh, co-founded by Timnit Gebru, uh, which is precisely trying to get black researchers, and I'm not talking only um, you know, star researchers, I'm talking precisely students, even undergrad students, to become part of this community and actually to be able to be heard. Because the first thing we can do is uh, is listen. There was last week a call for uh, NeurIPS. So NeurIPS is the main conference uh, on one of the major conferences on machine learning um, or AI. And the deadline for submissions of papers was last week. Uh, now, NeurIPS, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, an article in NeurIPS currently for a young researcher can make or break their career. Having a paper in your apes is a big uh, big thing to put on your CV and uh, it, it, it can really turbocharge your career. Now, in the middle of the, the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously, uh, someone pointed that, well, for all the, the, the current black researchers, black young researchers um, who have this deadline coming up, but are also out protesting or even not protesting, but deeply affected by what's going on, can we, shouldn't we extend the deadline? And there was a lot of debate around that on, on, on Twitter about doing so, and everyone acknowledged that extending the deadline is not going to, you know, fix the conditions in which these students are working. And to address one question in the in the Q and A, it's not either going to suddenly provide funding to tons of uh, students from minority background that cannot afford even to study. But at least that was a first step to uh, to consider. You know, even just thinking uh, about it, actually, you know, extending that. But it needs, when I see the amount of debate that went around it, uh, and I see the amount of uh, passionate researchers, even, you know, white like myself, or who thought, oh yeah, I've got three more days to augment my own paper. I was like, no, that's not the point. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a lot there as a machine learning community to really shut up, listen, actually, learn directly because it's not you know the burden is not on black and ai to educate us um but most importantly every step we take as as a community to look and, and think hard hold on am i reinforcing uh, reinforcing here a, 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 an, an imbalance and that goes if you think about oh i'm gonna take a, a massive data set i need a massive data set and i'm gonna start you know get get a shop to label it where who are the graders usually uh, of these data set. Who are the, the labeling shops? There are sweatshops and they're typically not affluent uh, uh, European people behind the sweatshops. So we have to be uh, uh, acutely uh, uh, aware of, of that. Right, so John, I just wanted to, to ask you a little bit. So Maria gave this, you know, very good sort of idea, you know, the, the political sort of top-down level, you know, inroads there to make the politicians aware of the opportunities and what's going on but I was thinking also more about from the other the other side and from the bottom up side a little bit you know what the practical things can can we do so this as Julian mentioned there's been some questions in the chat about well you know education sounds great but uh, if people can't necessarily afford it you know the uh, societies have you know have often been in terms of education dominated by this idea of you know institutionalized education through universities, which is not necessarily something which is easily accessible by, by for many people. So what other are, are there sort of you know what concrete sort of you know bottom up kinds of approaches are there in education which are going to be you know specific things that people can can reach to? Uh, so yeah um, <clears throat> yeah we were approach. I, I was head of department, as obviously you know, uh, over a number of years at UCL in computer science, and uh, we were approached by a company that I won't name uh, to uh, enable us to provide an online education um, platform and delivery. But I was really quite shocked, the uh, more I think about it, in a way, the more shocked I am, uh, that they uh, were proposing to charge the same fees for online as for in-person education. Um, and indeed, that is their, the model they have adopted and are executing around the world, uh, principally in the United States, but uh, uh, elsewhere as well. I, I believe that's you know, exactly the wrong message to send. I think if 
we are able to deliver online education, it should by almost by definition and definitely in this case be significantly cheaper to deliver. And we should pass on that saving to the, uh, the recipients of that education. Uh, so I think, you know, we have a moral obligation and, and this is, you know, the question in a sense you're asking. I do believe we have a moral obligation to attempt as part of our mission of education to deliver the education. Obviously, it's not free necessarily, but at, at a cost that is, you know, commensurate with the expenses involved in delivering it. Um, so that is one thing, but I also think the point I was making earlier, and I actually put an answer in the chat just a moment ago, which was to say that I think AI actually has the potential to deliver uh, so open educational resources are by definition free. They are open documents created, and I mentioned this recommendation that the UNESCO has uh, adopted that uh, supports the you know, the, the development and, and use of open educational resources. Um, and so the question, of course, is how accessible, you know, how can you find what's appropriate for you and how can you, you know, put together a series of resources that will give you the upskilling that you require either because of your interests or because of the, you know, the, the, the job that you might be uh, hoping to, to uh, apply for. And there, I think, you know, is where AI can deliver value. Uh, it can actually help to organize the material, understand the connections between it, sequence it, you know, understand your needs potentially. I'm not saying it's there now, but I think, you know, we're making progress in that direction uh, where we may be able to have a system that will deliver for individuals across the world a, you know, a tailored uh, educational program that will enable them to upskill. Um, it's still a fair way, but that's that's a kind of vision that might uh, be uh, attainable, I believe, and is certainly something that's worth uh, considering. Great, thanks. So, Maria, I just wanted to come back to you a little bit on. So, you know, in some sense, we've we've got a sense of maybe there could be a sort of technological AI haves versus have-nots. You know, and I think uh, you know to some extent. Like John mentioned, the universities are hopefully, you know, their core remit is to make the world a better place through you know, teaching and research. But that's not necessarily the same for the industry. You know, they have they have to make some money. You know, they have other sort of priorities as well. Is you know, and right now we're seeing the industry as a also a very powerful force in the whole AI development and, and deployment and application. So you know. It's not necessarily just that the universities and the charities are going to be making efforts in the space. We also need industry potentially to also to play play a role. But there seems to be a little bit of tension here between, you know, they obviously perhaps have interests which are to, to keep some of this technology to themselves because it's commercially uh, valuable. But that may, on the other hand, create uh, sort of inequalities between the haves and, and the have-nots. And so how how are we going to address that? Is that something that's, you know, going back to your previous point, is that a political issue or is there something else there? How, how do we actually, you know, get the, the industry on board as well? Well, the interesting thing, uh, David, is that among the biggest companies that we have across the world today, we've got companies that actually they base their success on AI related technologies, I would put them. Companies like Google and Facebook, uh, they're using all sorts of AI technologies uh, behind the scenes. And it's, um, I, the tension is there, uh, it's profit uh, versus doing good. But I think we all um, have a social responsibility and these big companies in particular, they have a corporate and social responsibility in, in supporting uh, their local communities, but not just their local communities, providing support across, across the world. And a lot of these companies have already started doing that. For instance, Google, uh, Facebook. So there are, there, there's lots of good work uh, going, going on, but we need more of that. Um, and that, that, that is not easy. Uh, to achieve, and I'm afraid I don't have uh, a very concrete answer to give you and the solution of how we can go about and, and do this. But I think if we have the big the big companies 
Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all doing their bit, then others will follow. And I think there's a lot to be said about taking the lead in this initiative of uh, essentially ensuring education and AI technology reaches all, uh, because that's how you would essentially put your name out there, but in a very different way to being labeled as a company who does not pay taxes or all you are interested in is making, making more profit. And again, I, I do think we have a role to play here. An interesting, an interesting fact is that we, we have seen a lot of uh, academics and researchers in the last few years moving away from academia into these bigger companies, into research and development. So I wonder if some of, uh, of our colleagues could actually act as the, as the catalyst of bringing on board these uh, bigger companies to do their bit and then this can uh, trickle down into smaller companies, but it, it's all about all of us collectively understanding the kind of responsibility that we have in our in our hands. Julian, maybe maybe you can step in a little bit on this point. I mean, you've been, you know, you've seen uh, both sides of this coin. You obviously uh, worked in you know these, uh, these tech giants, but you've also seen you know, some of the smaller startups, but also the academic perspective. And this is very complex area but from from your side I mean how do you how do you see this tension between you know potentially the very uh, sort of powerful global forces actually and I'm, and I'm thinking not necessarily just about you know the US tech giants but more you know globally when we think about you know other uh, players as China actually also starts to become more more involved you know what what is how do we actually ensure in some sense that you know, not just the universities have this, you know, idea of the sustainable development goals at the forefront, but actually that the companies are really, you know, genuinely engaging with this idea. Okay, a full disclaimer. Uh, politically, I'm slightly on the left of Che Guevara, uh, and uh, after having seen many different uh, way for for things to work, I believe that the best way to have large players, uh, large corporate players from across the globe is through regulation and regulation with teeth. I encourage reading uh, the work by Cory Doctorow uh, on uh, antitrust uh, work and adversarial inter interoperability. Uh, that sounds very dry, uh, but it is quite key and especially uh, with AI because it is hard to make sure that a small startup uh, can piggyback on some of the big giants and give a service that accesses the same platforms that uh, already exist and be able to immediately get uh, in the frame, really change, kind of topple uh, the large ones, which at the moment uh, is blocked because the there is this very um, specific to AI effect of once you're big, you start getting more and more data and you get better and better models and uh, therefore you get better service and more people and more data and more et cetera, et cetera. Now, antitrust um, legislation and, and, and more generally any uh, regulatory incentive for large organizations to actually um, look beyond their quarterly return um, is, I believe, the only way to go forward, or the main way to go forward. That, and obviously, um, the kind, and that's starting to become a little less true. But the last few years, talent, uh, talent, um, speaking up. So there has been a race for um, machine learners everywhere, and you could decide with your feet where you go and whether you keep, you know, working for a, a company that you disagree with. I've seen people last week were uh, walking out, uh, resigning from Facebook. Uh, because of uh, Zuckerberg's latest comment. So there is a th th there is a, a, an aspect there. Now that's for the the, the large uh, the the very large players. And and sadly at the moment it's in a way I find it sad that when we say okay how do we get uh, AI to help? Or do we the first thing is well we need this and that and these giant uh, corporations to 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 step in. When a few, you know, a few years ago, decades ago, we'd have said, oh, we need the governments uh, to step in or we need elected uh, institutions to step in. Sadly, we're, we're past that now when it comes to, to tech, uh, which is where it goes towards 
educating back and educating we're not talking about the global south versus global north as someone asked in the in, in the q a um, we're talking about educating everyone there is this fantastic um course again fantastic i'm sorry i should ban that word uh really really well done um really well thought course online called the the elements of ai no relation with my former employer element ai so the course is the elements of ai was done by uh, i believe norway one of the nordic countries apologies if i get it wrong and the eu has ordered its translation in every language in the eu and that is made for people who have no technical background to understand a little bit more about what uh, AI is. And that is fundamental because when you have, like last week, on the, you know, on the back of COVID, uh, you had the UK government reaching out precisely to large corporate players, um, Palantir, Microsoft, Google, faculty, a, a London startup, um, and reaching out to them to say, hey, can you help on COVID with, uh, with AI and uh, let's make a, a contract by which you can access NHS data to be able to work on that. Now. A small, and that's why there's, there's this real David versus Goliath aspect, a very small non profile called Foxglove, Foxglove uh, Lego. They are two full time employees, managed to force uh, the UK government to release the contracts uh, between uh, these giants, uh, corporations, and, uh, and the UK government, and especially the part relating to the, the modality and the IP of the, the modality of access to the data and the IP. Now, this is something that is super arid to anyone in the street. Uh, but as soon as you start to take a simple class like the elements of AI, you can start to understand, hold on, with this contract, we are having Palantir, uh, who is also working with a World uh, Food Program, and that made a massive, uh, a massive scandal when it came out. Now, we have Palantir, this gigantic corporation founded by Peter Thiel, who is not quite the most idealistic man on earth, um, and we're having them access the NHS data and being able to retain their trained models uh, and their trained embeddings. And okay, now you can start to see how that is a problem. For that, you need education at the individual level and courses like the elements of AI uh, are, are, and the EU pushing for it to be translated in every language are, are I think they're extremely important. Great, great, thanks. So I'm just conscious a little bit of time, we've got about two minutes left. So John, I. Uh, I was hoping maybe you'd be able to sort of give us a you know final sort of sum up thoughts in you know less than one minute. What is what are the next steps? What are the what are the take home messages from? Well, I think uh, well, thanks, and uh, I think the, the take home message from the point of view of uh, uh, you know AI and sustainable development goals is that the potential is huge. I think that we have uh, a responsibility to think carefully about this. I would perhaps come back to one of the points I made at the beginning and link to what uh, uh, Maria had just said. I think that creating uh, more objective measurement of these sustainable development goal provision will open up uh, a potential for much more funding to come in. We're seeing that in, you know, talking to venture capitalists that have uh, funds that are interested in funding in this area. So there is money interested in going into this area, but they want to see more objective measurement. And it opens also something, uh, open up the uh, possibility of what are called social impact bonds, where governments may promise a certain amount of money if a company can deliver a certain impact, and maybe in education or whatever in their country. So there's also, it actually can directly impact uh, the funding of activity in that area. So I think that, that kind of, other level is something that's really important to think about. I know it may sound like capitalism to uh, those left of Jacob Iowa, but it's still, I think, important. Great, thanks. So we've got less than one minute left, so I'm not sure if Julian, you're going to get a time, chance to summarize, but Maria, <laughs> could you give us your final thoughts, please? Uh, well, for me, it's all about three things, which is education, education, education at all levels for everyone and free access to education at least at the very basic level um, and raising awareness and demystifying hypes and myths. Great, well thank you very much. I'm sorry Julian, we, we've run out of time um, but I'd like to thank all uh, the panelists for this fascinating discussion. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to uh, join sort of uh, follow-up conversations potentially uh, with any of us and uh, thank you very much for watching thank you very much thank you david thank you everyone thanks, thanks.
Thank you guys. Thanks. I'm going to stop broadcasting.